Eight years ago, during the week before Halloween, some friends and I decided to tell spooky stories around the campfire. We had always wanted to make a fire outside and hang out at night, but we were too young to go by ourselves, especially after midnight. That year things were different. We were no longer children, we thought, so we somehow convinced our parents to let us stay out late. We didn't tell them about the fire, obviously. Once we all gathered in front of my house, we only had to think of a good place to hang out, so that our parents wouldn't find out about the fire. We ended up making the fire near a small dirt road out by the forest, leading straight to the riverside. The setup was great, a creepy forest, the sound of the river flowing, crickets chirping, and the scary sight of an abandoned stone house in the background. It was a rather warm night for the time of the year, and the moon was shining over the forest, casting strangely shaped shadows on the walls of the abandoned house. It was quite unsettling when you caught a glimpse of a moving shadow out of the corner of your eye. By the time we had finished making the fire, the moon had moved slightly, and the shadows were gone, a thing which brought us a bit of relief. We found a slab of stone next to the river, and we used it as a makeshift stage in front of the fire for the storytellers to stand on while narrating their creepy tales. We took our flashlights out of our backpacks and started. A few stories in, it was finally my turn, so I grabbed my flashlight and headed towards the stage. I had just started my scary story when, all of a sudden, it was freezing cold. The flashlight turned itself off, and the wind started blowing violently, putting out the fire. I panicked, and I kept slapping my flashlight in the hope of it turning back on. Assuming it was a joke of mine, but still unsettled by the whistling of the wind, everybody instinctively reached for their flashlights, but none of them worked. Overwhelmed by fear, I slowly headed back towards the group. The light of the moon was no longer visible, either. It was like something just filled the area with darkness, or rather sucked all the light out of it, if that makes any sense. As I was walking without being able to see anything, I tripped on a rock and fell on the ground. The flashlight fell right next to my face. As my friends approached me, the flashlight suddenly turned back on, illuminating the front of the abandoned house. That's when we saw it. A little fair-headed doll, its pigtails adorned with red dotted ribbons, all covered in what looked like blood, was standing on the window ledge. We all freaked out, and the girls started screaming when the doll simply fell out the window for no reason whatsoever, followed by a weird metallic screech as it hit the ground. We had no choice but to grab our backpacks and run home. After a few days, a couple of older friends of ours came with us to investigate the house. They were clearly amused by our silly ghost story and didn't take us seriously. We've searched for hours, yet we found nothing there. However, when we were walking down the path leading to our abandoned campsite, we saw a trail of dried blood drops leading just off the main path into the thicket. The droplets grew farther and farther apart, and we eventually lost track of them. Shortly after that, a wolf howled at the moon. And judging by its loudness, it seemed to be quite close. As we were rushing back to the path, one of our older friends tripped over something and fell face first into the dirt. We saw a red dotted ribbon next to his face, quite similar to the ones the doll had. As we dug through the hard gravel, we came across a hand, a little girl's hand, covered in dry blood. I remember that night, all too vividly, as if the memories were etched into my very soul. It was a cold, moonless evening, the kind that sends shivers down your spine and makes you wish for the warmth and safety of home. But little did I know 
that home would offer no sanctuary from the horrors that awaited me. We were gathered around the campfire, a group of friends seeking refuge from the darkness. That enveloped the forest like a shroud. The flames danced and flickered, casting eerie shadows upon the trees that loomed ominously in the distance. It was then that I first heard it, a faint rustling in the underbrush that sent a chill down my spine. At first, I dismissed it as nothing more than the wind, but as the night wore on, the sounds grew louder and more insistent. It was as if something was stalking us, lurking just beyond the edge of the firelight, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. As the hours passed, a sense of unease settled over the group, casting a pall of fear and uncertainty upon us all. And then, just when we thought it couldn't get any worse, we heard it, a blood-curdling scream that pierced the night like a knife through the heart. We sprang into action, scrambling to our feet and reaching for whatever makeshift weapons we could find. But it was too late. Before we could react, it emerged from the darkness, a creature of nightmares that defied all logic and reason. Its form was that of a wolf, but twisted and contorted in ways that no living creature should be able to endure. Its eyes burned with an otherworldly light, filled with malice and hunger, as it advanced upon us with slow, deliberate steps. I could hear the others screaming, begging for mercy as the creature closed in for the kill. But I was frozen in place, unable to move as the horror of what was happening washed over me like a tidal wave. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature was gone, leaving behind nothing but a trail of destruction and death in its wake. We were shaken to the core, our minds reeling from the trauma of what we had witnessed. But the horror was far from over, for in the days and weeks that followed, we would come to realize that the creature we had encountered was no ordinary wolf, but a skinwalker, a creature of ancient legend and unspeakable evil. They say that once you encounter a skinwalker, it will haunt you for the rest of your days. A void of fear and despair that lurks in the shadows, waiting to claim its next victim. And as I sit here now, recounting the events of that fateful night, I can't help but wonder if it's still out there, watching and waiting for the perfect moment to stalk again. Our trip started in late February as my three friends, John, Steve, Max, and I drove in my truck deep into the backwoods of Boxwood Gulch to follow the North Fork of the South Platte River. Steve owns a cabin up in the backcountry so we left my truck there and began our 57 mile hike into the wooded terrain following the river. We had all of our camping and fishing gear packed and enough food to hopefully last us the three day journey both ways. As we first set out in the early morning, a few light snowflakes began to fall. The terrain was heavily wooded and uneven making for slow going. The cool mountain air rustled through the trees and sunlight streamed through the canopy making the snowflakes glint and shimmer as birds chirped overhead and the river babbled in the distance. It was going to be a near perfect trip. We stopped for a quick rest a few hours in. 
The weather had been slowly worsening since we had left, but it was only then that we realized how bad it had gotten. The snow was whipping around us in a blinding flurry as the wind howled, making the trees creak and sway, almost threatening to snap. And two, the ground had already accumulated a good six inches of snow. It was about midday, but the sky was black. And I don't mean dark due to the ever-intensifying storm. I mean that in between the gaps in the clouds, there was no blue, just solid black. None of us really made a note of it at the time, as it was hard to notice through the thick cascade of snow and the limited visibility. After continuing our hike for some time, however, it became all too apparent that something was wrong. In addition to the sky, we also realized that there was nothing in the distance. There should have been some mountains or something like there had been at the start, but no matter which way we turn, the world only seemed to extend 50 or so feet around us. Then it disappeared into the blizzard. It was nighttime now, or at least. It was dark out, but it was to a clock in the afternoon. As we walked forward, new things slowly came into view. But everything behind us disappeared, and although we could progress further, we couldn't seem to double back. Once we left something behind us, we couldn't reach it again. Steve had forgotten his lighter a little while back when we stopped to eat, but when we tried to turn around and go back, we were greeted by a wall of snow and fog impossible to see through. Our flashlight's beams didn't penetrate the fog. They stopped as they hit it as if it was a physical wall. Curious, Steve reached out and moved his hand into the fog. First his fingertips and then his whole hand disappeared into the haze. We all stood in disbelief, looking at the wall which was impossibly tall and extended as far as we could see. There was no real gradient to it. Things didn't fade into the distance. There was a clear line where the wall began, and nothing was visible beyond that point. We were making a note of this when Steve muttered something. What was that? I asked. I... I can't feel my hand. He said slowly as if realizing it as he said it. Puzzled, he retracted his hand slowly, and then screamed. His glove was shredded, almost disintegrated, and his hand looked like it had been forced through a wood chipper. Deep gashes revealed white bone underneath, and what fingers were left were stripped clean. We all panicked. Oh God, oh God, this is bad, Max cried. Steve simply stood clutching what was left of his hand and hyperventilating. We had to get him to a hospital, or he would certainly bleed to death. But we were almost a day's walk from Steve's cabin, which was already remote enough. We were all frantically checking our phones for a signal when the worst happened. Steve fainted, his eyes closed, his legs buckled, and he fell. Forward, into the fog. None of us noticed at first, but when we finally did, all we could see were his legs protruding from the mist. We immediately, without thinking, rushed to pull him out. We grabbed his legs and strained to drag him back into view. Before we even saw him, however, we immediately regretted doing so. We somehow knew what we would find. The thing we dragged out was not Steve, not anymore. All of his skin was cleaved off, his rib cage ripped open with his entrails spilling out, and his face. It haunts me to this day, not merely because it was horrendously mutilated, not merely because his eyes have been torn out leaving only empty sockets but because it smiled at me a big wide smile that started small but the gashes in his face allowed it to literally stretch from ear to ear max screamed and shoved steve's mangled body back into the fog we ran as fast as we could the only way we could deeper into the woods just as before, the snow and fog parted before us, but swallowed up everything we left behind. As we ran and ran, 
The scenery around us began to slowly change. The trees surrounding us were now withered and dead. The grass was flattened and bleached. In fact, everything around us was dead. Colors had all but disappeared leaving only shades of gray and an intensified feeling of loneliness and death. While we ran, I realized something. Guys, I shouted while I ran not daring to stop for even a minute. We can't turn around and go straight back. But maybe we can circle around back to Steve's cabin. Then we can get the truck and get the hell out of here. John and Max nodded their heads and we turned 90 degrees right and continued running. Eventually, we ran through what appeared to be a herd of deer. All of which were laying on the ground, gray and lifeless hacked to pieces, blood soaked the ground. As we ran through the herd, dodging corpses, it was hard not to notice that their dead lifeless eyes seemed to follow us. When we felt confident enough that we wouldn't be doubling back on ourselves, we turned towards Steve's cabin, towards safety. We ran for at least another hour. Eventually, however, none of us could run any longer. Our bodies simply wouldn't allow it and we were forced to stop. After some time, Max, John, and I managed to get a fire going despite the snow and damp tinder. We had hoped that it would bring some sense of warmth and security, but we were wrong. The flames were a bright orange hue, bleeding some color into the grayscale world. It clearly did not belong, nor did we. The longer the flames crackled and popped, the more we began to hear something distant and quiet at first, but slowly growing closer, louder and more numerous. A chorus of blood-curdling wails and moans soon filled the air around us. Focused on the fire and pretending to be safe, mesmerized by its beauty, we didn't immediately notice a mangled deer carcass slowly dragging itself out of the fog and into view. Nor did we notice the second nor the third. Finally, we snapped out of our trance just in time to scramble to our feet in terror as a myriad of different animal carcasses climbed out of the fog, drawn to the strange light of the fire. We were intruders in their world. I was paralyzed by fear, unable to breathe. I turned to my friends to find that they were no longer beside me. They had taken off running, leaving me behind. I turned around to run after them, but something grabbed me by my shoulder. I didn't need to turn around to know what it was. I could tell by the hand gripping my shoulder, a hand. That looked like it had gone through a wood chipper. I flailed and managed to free myself before it could get a good grip on me, and I took off running. I didn't look back. No way did I want to see the face of what was once my friend. I could no longer see John or Max, and I assumed that they must have been ahead of me. But I was the one with the keys to the truck and Steve had the keys to the cabin. They wouldn't be any safer if I couldn't meet up with them. So I ran and ran faster and for longer than any human could possibly do under normal circumstances. Finally, after God knows how long, I could faintly make out a structure in the distance. It was the cabin. I felt a twinge of hope. The whales continued to ring out in the night air, but I seemed to have a lead on them at the time. I reached the truck, unlocked it, and jumped inside. I scanned the area for Max or John, but could see neither. I couldn't just leave them, but I couldn't wait forever either. I sat sweating and shaking nervously as the whales grew closer and louder. I had just about made up my mind to leave when I could suddenly make out someone sprinting towards me. It looked like Max. I started up the truck and motioned for him to run faster. But for some reason, I found myself subconsciously pressing the lock button, locking all of the doors. My instinct told me that something was wrong. I looked down at my hands. They were shaking like crazy. I looked back up and Max's horribly mutilated face was pressed up against the driver's window, staring at me, smiling. He was trying to open the door. I slammed my foot on the gas and drove off. Shaking like a madman 
and holding back the vomit. As I drove home, the sky slowly brightened back up into a blue hue and I could eventually see the sun breaking through the clouds. It was 9 o'clock in the morning. I began to see other cars on the road and the people inside waved at me as I waved at them. Nice normal people. I went straight home and asked my girlfriend to marry me. Just kidding. I'm sitting in my house now. Door locked and barricaded. Windows boarded up. And I'm writing this story. And I felt happy for the first time in a long time writing the ending. But that's not how it ended. I merely wish it had worked out like that. The truth is, as I drove, the sky did not brighten up, the sun did not reappear, and the fog still surrounded me as it now surrounds my house. I hear wailing all around and knocks at my door constantly, and when I look through the peephole, all I ever see is something smiling at me. The stench of death is everywhere. The phone doesn't work. The TV and radio broadcast nothing but static and I hear the locks on my door being undone at night and I must constantly keep watch and relock them. I'm simply waiting for the night. They get into my house when I forget to check the door or when they break through a window or when I wake up in the middle of the night to see them next to me. Their smiles inches away from my face.